Hello, hi, welcome. I'm glad you're interested in what I read in September. That's pretty cool if you're watching this. Uh, I decided to just do this in order to break up the general monotony of my life. But I recognize starting with a wrap-up video is not the most enticing nor the most conventional. So, um, yeah, that's something. But we're just going to move on and we're going to get on with it because it's the end of the month and it felt like a good thing to do. So in September, I read 12 books, four romances, four mysteries, two contemporary fictions, one fantasy, and one literary fiction. Um, I can't believe I was able to recall that. So because it's the month of September, and I'm sure most people, including myself, just want a nice mystery to cozy up with, with a blanket and a cup of coffee, I'm gonna start with those. So the first mystery I read was For Your Own Good. And this book is a set in a private school, so it does have some dark academia vibes, but not as strongly as the next one I'll talk about. Um, we're immediately introduced to a teacher who's willing to do whatever it takes to make sure that his students are the best students and to they succeed no matter the costs. And so immediately you're thrown into the perspective of someone who um, is a psychopath but thinks he's God's gift to earth. And that was a really fun perspective to read. The book alternates between teachers and the students and it explores how the events unfold of some murders going on in this school. Um, it is quite fast paced and hard to summarize because the plot shifts so much throughout the book. I mean, you just never know what's going to happen. And like I said, I really loved the idea of digging deep into someone who's just not all there and not good and seeing how they rationalize and justify their actions but unfortunately for me this book didn't feel engaging enough even though it was a fast-paced book i was having to force myself to keep on reading it and anytime i have to do that it's usually just not a good sign for me um and so i gave it a three out of five the next book though that i read that was similar in the sense that it was also set in a private college and really had those dark academia vibes was in my dreams i hold the Knife by Ashley Winstead. This book is about a group of friends who are super close in college only to fall apart when one of them is murdered. Ten years later, the case is still unsolved, and as they've come back for their tenure reunion, someone has decided it's finally time for the murder to be resolved. The book goes back and forth between the past and the future, looking at the events that led up to the murder, but then also how it's impacted everybody else in the group, um, and slowly reveals the secrets that they're holding. I really liked this book. Almost, I mean, it did take me probably a few chapters to really get in because the characters in this book are not likable. Um, Jessica is the main character and she, I love hated her the entire book. She's just an awful human being. I would never be friends with her in real life because I would probably murder her. She would be the murder victim. But I still loved her by the end, like I still was rooting for her, which was, I think, testament to how the story was told. But then once I did get hooked into the book, I couldn't stop. I was reading until, you know, early, early hours of the morning to finish it. I specifically liked how this book had really complex characters that I was exploring. It wasn't just that these friends were trying to figure out this mystery. Um, there was a lot more deeper exploration about the pressures that uh, students feel or people feel to succeed in life and also the different group dynamics that you may feel. The only reason I ended up giving this a four out of five stars is because there were a lot of unrealistic situations and moments in the book that took me like out of the story. Uh, for example, there was this one scene where Jessica walks into the room, her 10 year college reunion, and all the heads apparently turn to stop and look at her. I'm sorry, there's no way I would stop eating my salmon puff to turn my head and stare at someone unless it was Jessica Alba or Jessica Simpson, and even that is questionable. So it's kind of hard to make me believe that she had that much power and that school was such a clicky school um, that that would happen in. So if you can ignore some of the unrealism in the book, I think it's a great mystery. It's probably my most recommended mystery of what I read in September.
The next book also had a group of friends reconvening after losing contact or not being as close, and that was The Weekend Escape by Reiki Bennett. This was an ARC. I, I believe it gets published this week, um, so maybe you could get it if it sounds interesting. This reminded me a lot of The Guest List by Lucy Foley in the sense that it was in the same secluded island off of the UK. I mean, not the same island, but it was an island off of the UK that had the same um, atmosphere. It was a group of friends coming together for an event or um, in this case they were coming together for like a girls trip an adventure trip together and as they're going through the weekend they're realizing someone in their midst has malicious intentions I liked this book I specifically liked how atmospheric it was it spent a lot of time on the natural setting of the island what I didn't love is how predictable the book ended up becoming I figured out what was going to happen almost immediately and so when reading it I wasn't really reading because I was kept on my toes or I wanted to know what happened next I was just there along for the ride so because of that I ended up giving it a three out of five the last mystery I read was a YA mystery and that was The Inheritance Game by Jennifer Lynn Barnes. The next book in this series, The Hawthorne Legacy, just came out so I saw this book everywhere and figured I'd give it a try. And if you've watched Knives Out, it is very reminiscent of that. The only thing missing is Chris Evans' holy sweater. Um, there is a young girl who is orphaned. Her name is Avery. She is living in her car just trying to survive high school get into a good college so that she can make something of her life when all of a sudden she learns that she is the sole inheritor of tobias hawthorne's estate and tobias hawthorne is one of the richest men in the world and by giving avery everything he's disowned his own family which includes two daughters and four grandsons so the question clearly is why did he choose to give everything to avery and why did he disown his entire family in the process Within pages, I was hooked. I mean, this is the definition to me of a hooking book. Um, it immediately draws you into the story. The writing style is very concise and the chapters are quick so you can move through it really quickly. I genuinely loved this book. The only thing that I didn't love about it is it really promised to have puzzles and riddles and mysteries and by the end, I was like, okay, yeah, it does. But there was never a time that I was like, Oh my gosh, what? It was more of a, oh, okay. But I will say it's a good mystery. It has some good riddles. It has some love. It has a likable character. What more could you want except for affordable healthcare? Moving on from the mysteries, a book that I think is a good transition from summer to fall, if you're still trying to hold on to the warm weather, is Ghost Wall by Sarah Moss. And I still do have a copy of this one to show. Um, first, look at this cover. I just think it is stunning as a cover. Um, I own, I mean, I got this book because I judged it by its cover. I just thought it was beautiful. It's also super short. It's only 130 pages, so it's a quick to go through. And this book was written in context of Brexit, but I think it has a lot of parallels and applications to what the United States has been going through the past few years because it really explores how when people idealize and romanticize the past and past ways of living, it can end up turning into prejudice today and toxic behaviors or harmful behaviors. Um, and so it does that by telling us a story of Sylvie and her family who have teamed up with a professor and his students to do this um, reenactment of life. So they pretend to live like those in the Iron Ages uh, for I can't remember, some period of time. The book only covers like a week or so. And as they're getting more immersed and immersed in this reenactment, uh, they are starting to engage in darker and darker behaviors. And so although short, this book is super suspenseful and tense. And if I could use one word to describe it, it would definitely be haunting. This is a haunting book. It stuck with me what happens and some of the imagery that Moss creates or writes in here. Um, it's just beautiful as a book. And the reason I say it's a good transition book is because even though it is creepy and suspenseful and haunting, it all happens during summer when the grass is green and there's flowers and the sun is shining. And um, so in that instance, it's kind of like midsummer where even though it's beautiful, it's really hella creepy and I recommend it. I gave it a four to five just because it didn't blow my mind. Um, I thought it was a good read. I didn't think it was 
amazing but I do have the feeling that if I reread it I would end up giving it a five out of five because once it percolates and I really think about it I think I'll appreciate it more on a read through the second read through going on to the fantasy really quick i read the last graduate by naomi novik this is a second book in the scholomance series the first one was a deadly education so because it was a sequel i'm not going to talk about it too much um because i think you have to know what a deadly education about is first i'll just say that i enjoyed it uh, if you liked A Deadly Education, I think you're gonna like Last Graduate. The next two books were contemporary fictions, and the first one is um, Last Summer at the Golden Hotel. And this, I don't know why I keep comparing everything to movies, but maybe that's just how my brain works. This reminded me a lot of Dirty Dancing, and to be honest, Reminders of Dirty Dancing are never a bad thing because Patrick Swayze. Let's just put that out there. This book is about two families who co-own this massive hotel in the Catskills um, that has been a mainstay institution for families for decades. Unfortunately, due to recent times and people no longer really going to those types of resorts, the hotel is suffering. And when they get an offer from a casino group to buy out the hotel and the land, the families have to come together to decide what to do. The book is narrated by different characters or different members from each family from all the different generations. So you have the grandparents who founded the hotel, the, their kids who currently run the hotel and then their kids who are realizing they could take more responsibility in the hotel. And I will say that what I really liked about this book was how nostalgic it felt. It made you want to go to a family reunion or to go spend time with your extended family to laugh at how funny family can be together and how they can perceive the same thing like technology so differently. I won't say that I loved this book though, just because I didn't like the characters very much. Like in my dreams, I held a knife, had awful characters, yet I loved them. In this case, they had decent characters, but I didn't like them. Um, I was, by the end of the book, I was more concerned about what was going to happen to the hotel than I was any of the characters, because I just didn't connect with any of them. Which for a character-driven book, that's a big barrier, I think. So in the end, I gave it a three out of five. I think if you like really character books about family, you might like this, but wasn't my favorite. The second contemporary fiction, though, I really enjoyed, and that was Erotic Stories of Punjabi Women by Jaspal Bali Kaur? Kaur? <laughs> how to pronounce, how to pronounce Kaur? How, how do you say it? Kaur. Cool. Um, this is a book I read from my local book club. We're actually meeting on Sunday to discuss it and I'm really excited because I went in with such low expectations of this book. When I got voted as this month's pick, I almost just didn't read it because it seemed too chick lit-ish. Um, but I loved it. I ended up really, really enjoying it, like thoroughly liking this book. And it's about a character named Nikki who spells it same way I do, which is really exciting because this is the first book I've read that has a protagonist as Nikki. She is an Indian woman living in London and immediately you're kind of tuned into the fact that she has these dueling parts of her identity, like that she is Indian or she's Punjabi, um, but she's also a Londoner and someone who's grown up in the UK and how those cultures tend to conflict and her not knowing where she stands in either one of them. Um, because she's strapped for cash, she ends up getting an opportunity to teach this creative writing course at the Punjabi center. When she gets there though, she realizes that the widows of the community are the only ones who showed interest in coming and they don't know how to read or write. So because of a series of events, they end up finding this book of erotic stories and realizing that these are stories that they know and that they want to tell. So Nikki helps them tell them. And I will say here, when I started reading this, I did not think it had erotic stories in it, but boy, was I wrong. Uh, this does have some steamy parts in it. So if you're not comfortable with that, or you're thinking about reading this on the bus, 
I would not recommend it, but I thought it was heartwarming. There is a little bit of romance, but it's mostly about the relationship and the connections that these women form together. And through the act of them telling these erotic stories, it really helps them value female pleasure. It helps them think about feminism and their place in the world. It connects generations that seemingly can't connect with each other. And I just thought it was a really good book. Um, I ended, I gave it a four out of five. It didn't blow my mind. Once again, I kind of reserve fives for books I think are going to be my favorite, but it was a strong four. I enjoyed it. Which feels like a good transition to the last category of books, which were the romances. So for these, I had two of my least favorite books. I mean, they are probably my least favorite books that I read this month, and then some of my favorite books I read. It was diverse, but isn't that romance? you know? The first book I didn't quite enjoy in the romance category was How to Love Your Neighbor by Sophie Sullivan. This was my third arc of the month. This book comes out at the beginning of 2022. And it's the story of two neighbors who immediately have reason to hate each other. You have Grace, who's inherited this house from grandparents she's never met, but gives her an opportunity to feel rooted in the community and connected. Um, and all she wants to do is make this house a home and graduate with her interior design degree. You then have Noah, who is the next door neighbor, who comes from a very wealthy family, but never feels that he does enough um, or that he's ever done something on his own. So he buys this house and decides this is where he wants to stay. He wants to build the perfect dream house for him to have the rest of his life in. And to do so, he needs Grace's property in order to expand his house. So immediately as this book starts as kind of an enemies to lovers, it transitions pretty quickly to a friends to lovers book. And the book's just about them falling in love. I didn't really connect with the characters nor their romance, which is why I think this was not a good romance for me. Um, I felt their dialogue with each other was so unrealistic. I mean, it's just they were so introspective and communicative about what they were thinking and feeling. All I could think when I was reading this was who is your therapist and can I have their number? Because you were just too on top of your shit. Like, that's just not how I think people react. Um, and so even though it's a healthy ideal, it was not what I wanted in a romance. I also am not a huge HGTV person. I don't really watch DIY. I have a Pinterest, but it's solely for recipes I will never make in life. And so because she's an interior designer, um, that aspect is a big part of the book. And I think if that's something you're interested in, you may enjoy reading it. I am not interested in it, so I kind of felt like I just had to move on through it to get to the actual romance. Um, so because of all that, it ended up being a two to three stars for me. The next book I really hated, and this is my least favorite book of the month, which is a strong stance to take because it is loved by all right now, and that is The Love Hypothesis by Allie Hazelwood. Boy, did I hate this book. I did not enjoy reading this whatsoever which is wild to me because if you go online if you look on goodreads this book is loved and adored by everyone i think some people would give their firstborn child for this book and i did not enjoy it the premise is that you have olive who is a phd candidate who embarks in this fake dating relationship with a tenured professor adam um, and they each have their reasons for being in this fake dating relationship and it was fine um, I feel almost where How to Love Your Neighbor was so, they just communicated so much and that felt unrealistic. This book, they didn't communicate at all and it was just incredibly frustrating. I just wanted to yell at them and say, talk to each other for the love of all that is holy. I also found this book to just have the most ridiculous tropes and scenes. Um, there's this part, for example, where they're at an academic talk, so a professor's visiting to speak, and apparently the room is just so crowded because fire codes don't exist that the only way for Olive to sit and listen to this talk is for her to sit on Adam's lap. So a grad student is sitting on a professor's lap in the middle 
of every in the middle of everyone and instead of people looking at them kind of scandalously because it is scandalous everyone's just smiling and thinking oh that's so cute i'm sorry that would never happen that is a lie ali hazelwood you were lying to the public because that's not how the academic world works i'm not sure if because i am in academia i had i'm overly critical of how it's depicted um but even if it wasn't, I did not connect with the characters. It was funny, there were some cute moments, but in the end, I started giving it a three star because I said, mm, it's fine. I woke up like angry about it, so then I said, nah, it's a two star. And I would give it a one star, but I'm afraid of the fan base it has, so it's gonna stay at a two star rating for me. Yeah. Um, I feel like I'm being negative, but the next two books I loved. So there is, you know, hope for this sad, shriveled heart of mine. Their first one was Seven Days in June by Tia Williams. This is a play off Romeo and Juliet, exploring what would happen if Romeo and Juliet actually could be together. Um, there was also a lot of influence from If Beale Street Could Talk by James Baldwin, I thought. But the story's about two characters, Eva and Shane, who met each other when they were 17, 18, in a really kind of perilous time in their lives. And they only spent seven days in June together, but it was a really life-changing, passionate um, encounter for them that's influenced the rest of their lives. 15, 15 liters in the future, they are both really successful authors who meet at a convention for black writers, and they have to deal with their past and figure out if they have a future together. I thought the book was really touching. I loved the characters. I was rooting for their romance. I was totally, based on the cover, expecting this book to be like deep and sad and kind of Nicholas Sparksy, um, but boy was I wrong. It was such a funny read. I mean, within the first paragraph, she's dying from a dildo and it doesn't stop in the humor. There's a lot of pop culture references. Um, this was the definition of a contemporary romance for me and I enjoyed it. Four stars out of five. Um, recommend if you just are trying to hold on to those summer months. The last book I read, the only five star of this month, was The Flat Share by Beth O'Leary. I will give disclosure that I read this in the middle of reading American Gods during a particularly slow and horror-filled section of American Gods. Um, so I don't know if I rated this five stars because it actually is a five star read or if it was just such a breath of fresh air that I didn't know I needed. Um, but I loved this book. I thought it was heartwarming. I thought it had a really good balance of talking about deep emotional issues, but also being lighthearted, fun, and heartwarming. Um, and so... I recommend it. I feel that a lot of people have already read this book, especially when Jojo Myers was popping off, so it might be old news, but if you haven't read it, I'd give it a gander. It's about two people who flash hair. Uh, Tiffy and Leon are both strapped for cash, so they decide to flash share the same place. The only weird part about this is that more than just sharing the apartment, they're sharing the same bed because Leon works as a night shift nurse and Tiffy works a more routine schedule from nine to five. Um, and so for the first few months they live together, they actually never interact. They never see each other face to face. But by communicating through little post-it notes and through texting and things like that, they start to get to know each other and it kind of documents their relationship as they're sharing this apartment. I will say, that a big part of this book is watching Tiffy accept and deal with the trauma of coming from an emotionally abusive relationship. So if you're not in the headspace to read that, this is not your romance. Um, that was really heavy to read, um, but I enjoyed watching her deal with it and seeing how she is supported in different ways. So I ended up giving it five out of five and that was the end. See, we're, we're ending on a good note because we are wholesome people in here. Those were the books. Um, this was fun. I had fun nerding out talking about these things. A lot more fun than I thought I was going to have. So maybe I will make another video or maybe not because this is also kind of stressful. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> Bye.